Good morning. It's good to be with you. We are concluding our series. It's complicated, but it doesn't have to be. And today we're talking about the single life. And those of you who are single, you're probably thinking something already that married people are not thinking right now, and that is there's a married guy up here talking to single people about it's complicated, but it doesn't have to be. But in preparation uh, for this message, I was able to uh, talk to a number of single people to be able to read uh, some great, great resources from people who are single. And I want to just share one with you um, this morning. And I would encourage all who are single and all who are married, actually, to read this book. It's called Seven Myths About Singleness by Sam Albury. And we're going to be putting that on our resource page along with all the other resources for this series. You can just go to sharethehope.org at the top of the menu bar, hit resources, and then you click on the the graphic for this series. It's complicated, and there's a bunch of resources there for marriage, uh, for parenting. Just a reminder, parents, grandparents, check out those free videos. They will bless your um, parenting and your kids. And then also resources for the single life. So I just wanted to make you aware of that. Now, the wonderful thing about hope is there is a number of single people in our congregation and lots of diversity when it comes to singleness. Uh, There are people in this room or people who are at the Brockport campus or watching online who unfortunately are now single because they have uh, lost their spouse um, through death. And so now you are experiencing something and dealing with things that you just never thought you'd have to deal with. And you have this huge crater of grief in your heart. Uh, Some in our congregation are single because of the pain of divorce. And you've gone through a huge amount of turmoil. And uh, you are maybe feeling feelings of failure or regret or disappointment. Uh, Whether it's death or divorce, now you have a whole new reality. And on top of that, you've got this ache in your heart. I know some people who have chosen to remain single. Uh, because of sexual orientation, and they want to honor God uh, with their bodies. I know other single people who have put off marriage because they want to wait until they're done uh, with their schooling or get settled into their vocation. For a number of singles that I know, it's just, you know, it's just um, waiting for the right person to come along. They just haven't met that person yet. I know some people who have deliberately chosen uh, the single life so they can devote themselves fully to ministry. Uh, or to their career. I even know some singles uh, who, in my opinion, courageously have chosen to stay single because they have grown up in such destructive, dysfunctional homes and their heart has been so wounded. uh, They don't want to carry that baggage into a marriage relationship. Many of the singles that I know would say singleness might not be their first preference, And if God brings somebody along, that will be great. But they are utterly content in their life right now. They are very fulfilled vocationally, relationally, and spiritually. Lots of diversity in our church. Single and alone, single and dating, single again, single with kids. And it can be complicated. And the reality is, each and every person in this room, whether married or single, all of us are flawed, broken, fallen, sinful people. And so there's going to be complications in our life because of that sinfulness. So we're going to talk about the single life, but just want to remind you, marriage and singleness are both gifts from God, but in a fallen world, they each come with their own difficulties. Neither is easy. Both can be painful. They both have their ups and downs. It's really easy for married people when they're going through a difficult time to kind of look at that single person and think, wow, man, that's, that's a wonderful kind of life. And it's really easy for single people when they're going through a really discouraging time to look at married couples and think, oh, that is a wonderful kind of life. And we just have to remember both have ups and downs, uh, difficulties and challenges and blessings. Today we're talking about the single life. We're going to be talking about the difficulties of that, but also the incredible blessings. But before you hear uh, from me and and from God's word, I want you to hear from a beautiful daughter of God, a member of our congregation uh, who happens to be single, and she's just going to share a little bit about her story. So if we could take a look at this video. Single. Not married. Maybe in a relationship. Maybe not. One. Alone. 
for as long as I can remember, all I ever wanted to be was a wife and a mother. Uh, but somewhere along the line, that was not God's plan. And it took me a long time, many years, and many tears to realize that maybe God's plan for me was to be single. Pshh, game changer, right? To recognize his plan for me took a lot of... Um, a lot of time and a lot of maturity in my faith, a lot of prayers to accept the course that he had laid out before me and to understand that it's okay to be single. You don't have to be in a relationship to be fulfilled. And quite honestly, the path that he's led me down has been filled with amazing beauty, tremendous opportunities and exceptional unexplained phenomenal gifts and you know a lot of people say well it must be great to be single you know the grass is always greener on the other side of the fence well, quite honestly it's a hard road um, to be honest with you I have to do all the chores in my house I have to do my own laundry shopping at Wegmans is a challenge because they don't cater to single people you know there are no single size stuff um, I have to do all my own lawn mowing chores, shoveling the driveway, anything that needs to be fixed, paying the bills is all on me. There's no help in those situations. But is there? Because God has not only provided for me in my physical needs, but he's provided for me in my uh, everyday life. I mean, he's provided people in my path who have filled gaps that might have been filled if I had a spouse or kids. But quite honestly, too, um, it's not all that it's cracked up to be. You know, there's times when you're going to be lonely, when it's, you know, you, you, you just kind of make your way through life and everybody thinks it's great on the other side of the fence. They wish they had your life and you wish you had theirs. But when you are following God's plan and in his peace and contentment, there's so much more. I mean, I realized as a single person that I could do things that I couldn't have done had I been married with children. I can minister, I can serve, I can travel the world, which I've done. And, and all those things are awesome. And it's a gift. And I understand not everybody is going to come to be accepting that singleness is a gift, but it is. It's a gift from God that he knows what he's doing, and I understand that. And I can follow that path and, and be content. It's not always perfect. There's times when I have my desires like anybody else. But the prayers are, Lord, help me be at peace with what you have given me, and he has. And I'll tell you what, Jesus is the perfect model. He was single, by the way. Jesus knew how to live the single life. He was able to minister and serve. He loved children. He went out to eat with friends. He traveled the world. He was lonely, but he was never alone, and neither am I. So as you just heard, there are difficulties and there are blessings, to be sure. Uh, when God said to Adam in the garden, it is not good for the man to be alone, many people think that God was saying it is not good for people to be single. He wasn't saying that. He was saying it's not good for people to be alone. Each and every one of us was created to be in relationship with other people, to know and be known to love and be loved, to serve and be served, to celebrate and be celebrated as people. And even those of you who are really introverted, like myself, and, and you're like perfectly fine working from home, you're perfectly fine shopping everything on Amazon, right? You hate it when preachers say to you in church, turn to the other person next to you and say something random out loud, right? Even those of you who are introverted like me, we need to have people in our lives. By the way, why don't you turn to somebody and... No, no, you don't have to say it. Don't do that. 
If you're a single, my guess is at some point, maybe people in your life, maybe even family members, maybe even people in this church, I gave you some messages that made you feel like you weren't enough if you didn't have a significant other. Maybe you didn't have a date when you went to a friend's wedding and ever since that friend has been trying to hook you up with somebody. Or maybe a parent, even though they say they're not pressuring you, uh, really wants you to get married so that they can have grandchildren. So there's pressure from society, there's pressure from family, from church, and, but then there's just that everyday difficulty and, and challenge. Uh, Christian leader and writer Kate Wharton says this as she's writing about her single life. When we have to fill in a form and check a box marked single, when we have to pay a single room supplement for a holiday, when we are faced with two-for-one supermarket offers that we know we'll end up throwing away, when we steal ourselves to enter a party alone, when we need someone to hold the other piece of flat-pack furniture we're building, when we come home to an empty house and there is no one to tell about the highs and lows of our day. At these times and many others, being single can feel like the raw end of the deal. And to married people, that may sound like it's not, those things aren't that big a deal, but they add up and they can be painful and they can be difficult. There's other difficulties for uh, the single life and that is the whole dating scene. And I'll be honest, I'm just glad that I don't have to navigate that anymore. I mean, you talk about complicated nowadays, right? Especially if you are a believer and you're a follower of Jesus Christ and you take that seriously. Generations ago, we called it courting because people would take their time just to get to know one another over a long period of time. And then it moved to dating where you have to do all kinds of events. And then there was speed dating. And now it's the hookup culture. And then there's other things that I won't even get into that can lead to all kinds of sinful complications and problems. Just an aside, the good news is there will be no dating in heaven, okay? No blind dates, no Dutch dates, no double dates, no bad dates. You know how I know that? Because Jesus said there will be no weeping or gnashing of teeth in heaven, all right? <laughs> there might be dating in hell, I'm not sure, but... <laughs> but the Bible doesn't have a lot to say about dating. But it does have a lot to say about who you spend a lot of time with, the types of character that people should have. Uh, Paul, who is single, uh, wrote in one of his letters um, a lot about relationships, and we're going to look at a couple of those passages. This one's from 1 Corinthians, kind of a guiding principle. Do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. It is almost impossible to live the right kind of life when you have the wrong kind of people always in your life. You have to ask yourself, what are their values? What is their character? Very quickly, uh, when it comes to dating, just a couple of things to contemplate. I think these will alleviate some complications. And in this first one, it's just opinion. So you can throw it out if you want. Um, but I really think dating should be uh, intentional not just recreational. Because I think it leads to all kinds of drama and, and complications. Uh, dating is not a destination. Recreational dating with some vague hope that maybe someday the relationship will lead to somewhere just doesn't usually work out. Now, obviously, you've got to get to know people and so on and so forth, but once you start that dating relationship and you realize it's not going somewhere, then, then you should stop the relationship. I agree with what Michael Todd says in his book, Relationship Goals. By the way, this is on the resource page as well. He writes, dating is not playtime. Dating is not pretending like you're married. Dating isn't treating a season like it's a lifetime. All those things lead to complications. Dating is transportation to a destination. And that destination is that relational goal of marriage. Marriage to somebody who shares your faith and your values. If the train that you're on is not leading to marriage, get off that dating train and wait until another person comes along. Second thing, now this you do if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, need to um, follow. And that is date for the glory of God. See, as Christians, we want to do everything to honor and glorify our God. As Paul writes, so whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Whatever you do, that includes dating. You and the person that you're dating should want to glorify God. 
Again, whatever you do, that means in every area. That includes what or who we let into our hearts, into our minds, and into our bodies. Which leads to this whole conversation about sexual relationship and being celibate before marriage. Now, I know in a culture that is hyper-sexualized, and many, many people have bought into the lie that it is impossible to be single and celibate, and that singleness and purity are like oil and water. They just don't mix. We got to talk about this. You hear the messages all the time, right, from our culture. You know, as long as you have two consenting adults and you don't hurt anybody, what's the big deal? That's fine. Let me just talk a little bit about consensual. Consensual isn't an argument for or against anything. Consensual is irrelevant. I love what Andy Stanley says. Bad judgment and consensual go hand in hand all the time. Many people know somebody who is a consensual adult who entered into a car with a person who is driving while intoxicated, and it did not end up well, even though it was consensual. Consensual and bad judgment happens all the time. Consensual is setting the bar way, way too low, but that's the wisdom of our world. God sets the bar really, really high, and that is sacrificial committed love. Because God knows this. Intimacy is fueled by exclusivity, not by experience. If you really love someone, you don't want to hurt that person in any way, right? You would all agree with that? If you do anything that might diminish someone's potential for intimacy with their spouse in the future, it is not good for them or their future spouse. Sex before marriage robs the person of their potential for exclusivity with their future spouse. And I know, singles, you are bombarded and pressured constantly. I mean, like 24-7. Don't wait until marriage. It is a huge, difficult battle. And by the way, married people, it doesn't help when we just uh, blow off that difficulty and just say, hey, good luck, <laughs> you're on your own. Just, just be pure. It's interesting. Rarely do married people say to their single friends, hey, as a show of solidarity to help you resist sex, I'm going to take a vow of celibacy as long as you are single. Married people rarely do that, right? Just to be clear, I'm not making that vow today, just so you know that, okay? Some of you, and I know because we have talked, and I know there's many others, you carry around the pain of sexual brokenness and past failures and past regret. And maybe some of you are wondering, how would Jesus respond to you? And you need to know this. You need to hear this. When Jesus, as we heard, who was single, when he walked this earth, he got into an awful lot of hot water with a certain group of people because he showed scandalous amounts of forgiveness and grace and love and mercy to those who had sexual scars. He forgave them, he loved them, he accepted them, he filled their hearts with joy, he equipped them for relationships to do well, and he blessed them, and he used them to bring glory to his name. You just need to know that about our Savior. See, Jesus knows what it's like to be single. I don't know if this happened. Maybe it did when he was like at the wedding at Cana. You know, maybe people came up to his mom and just whispered in her ear, Look, Jesus is like 30 years old. What's wrong with him? He's not married yet. He knows what that's like. Jesus knows the challenges. As you heard, he's the perfect model, but he promises to be even more than that, to be with you every moment and to empower you. Jesus took our place. He willingly became fully human for us. And you got to think about that. That means he was a sexual being. The Bible says he was tempted in every way, every way that we are, yet was without sin, which means he didn't even have sinful thoughts. He was without sin. Jesus is the most complete, totally fulfilled, fully human who ever lived on this earth. So his being single is not incidental. As Sam Albury writes, Jesus' single life shows 
that none of those things that we think are absolutely necessary to be a human being, marriage, romantic fulfillment, sexual experience, none of those things is intrinsic to being fully human. The moment that we say otherwise, the moment we claim a life of celibacy to be dehumanizing, we are implying that Jesus himself is only subhuman. Is purity incredibly difficult in our culture? Absolutely. But Jesus is with us. So there's challenges to the single life, but there are incredible blessings as well. Paul, who is single, uh, wrote these words. I want you to live as free of complications as possible. When you're unmarried, you're free to concentrate on simply pleasing the master. Marriage involves you in all the nuts and bolts of domestic life and in wanting to please your spouse, leading to so many more demands on your attention. The time and energy that married people spend on caring for and nurturing each other, the unmarried can spend in becoming whole and holy instruments of God. I'm trying to be helpful and make it as easy as possible for you, not make things harder. All I want is for you to be able to develop a way of life in which you can spend plenty of time together with the master without a lot of distractions. What Paul is reminding us is singleness is not a curse. Being single like him, there's an opportunity in that season of singleness uh, to grow and, and to become whole and holy. Uh, when I was single in my 20s, it was the best time of my life for my own growth. No doubt about it. doesn't mean I stopped growing, but it was, the, it was the best time for me to really look at myself, look at my heart, learn to love myself, accept myself, to understand how God created me and how he wanted to use me and to receive his love and his acceptance. You are worth discovering who you are. And when you are single, especially when you're single and younger, this is a great time to do that, to walk with the master, Jesus, in such a way that he reveals to you your gifts and your abilities, your weaknesses and areas that you need to grow, your strengths, your hopes, your dreams. In your season of singleness, you can draw closer to God in prayer in reading his word each and every day. And you have more time to understand God and to allow him to grow you. Become the best version of who you can be. Make sure that you are becoming whole and holy so that if the Lord does bless you with a spouse one day, you go into that marriage whole and holy and you will be able to serve uh, the other. Marriage counselor Dr. Les Parrott says this, if you try to build intimacy with another person before you have gotten whole on your own, all your relationships become an attempt to complete yourself. See, Jesus is God's design for humanity, whether married or single. That's why Jesus said to all people, married and single, follow me, study me, walk with me. Let me show you the art of living well. One of the beautiful things that Jesus showed so well in, in his single life was this gift of friendship. I believe we've lost the art of friendship. And maybe those of you who are younger can bring it back because it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. Jesus committed himself to his disciples, but it wasn't just a mentor-mentee kind of relationship. He actually called them friends. He loved them. They loved him. They did life together. They talked about fun things. They joked together. They also talked about incredibly deep things. And Jesus never deserted his friends. And after his resurrection, they never deserted him. In fact, they even gave their lives for him because he first gave his life for them. You talk about friendship. Some of my best friendships were formed when I was single. Now, I know that's not always the case. Intimate friendships, a marriage partner, those don't always materialize in this broken world. And our hunger for closeness and community might not be fully realized. In fact, it won't be perfectly to, for any of us. But as a follower of Jesus Christ, you need to hear this, and hopefully you will believe it because it's as true as I am standing here before you. Your ultimate hope for intimacy, emotional, relational intimacy, whether married or single, will one day be fully realized. Jesus says it will if you follow him. 
It won't be totally complete, not in this lifetime, because this world is temporary. This world is sinful. Jesus says this at the end of uh, his gospel uh, in Luke. Incredible words about the life to come. He said, the people of this age marry and are given in marriage. That's what we do. But those who are considered worthy of taking part in the age to come, those who are considered worthy, by the way, are those who trusted, believed in Jesus as their Savior and Lord. Those who are considered worthy of taking part in the age to come and in the resurrection from the dead will neither marry nor be given in marriage. One day, consummation, ultimate joy and intimacy will come to all who believe in Jesus Christ. And you have to understand, friends, heaven is not going to be divided by single people over here and married people over here. There's not going to be like single mansions and married people mansions in heaven. It doesn't work that way. Jesus wants us to know that there will be such connection of our soul, such profound and infinite love from God. Every human being will know what it is to be chosen and to be wanted and to be celebrated and to be loved. And God wants everyone to know this, that he spoke these words through his prophet Hosea, powerful words, some of the most powerful words in all of Scripture. In that day, declares the Lord, you will call me my husband. I will betroth you to me forever. I will betroth you in righteousness and justice, in love and compassion. I will betroth you in faithfulness, and you will acknowledge the Lord. No matter how deeply desired and loved you have felt or not felt, God says these words, amazing words, I betroth you to me. And, and to, there's, there's something amazing in your future, kind of like a wedding. It, we have, God has to use this image because there's nothing else on this earth like to show his incredible love. A relationship of such breathtaking, awe-inspiring intimacy. We can't even imagine. And it will be with the God of the universe himself. A relationship in which you will never be insecure. You will never have to doubt. You will never be hurt. You will never question. You will never fear. You will never have to prove. You will never have to wonder. You will be fully known. And you'll be fully loved. You may have been hurt by someone in this life, and I know some of you have been hurt badly. But the day is coming when God himself will wipe every tear from your eyes. And he will so fill you with his glory and his love and his presence that you will be incapable of ever shedding tears again except those tears that come from the deepest joy. And I hope that day comes for all of you. It will if you believe in Jesus Christ and you receive him as your Savior and Lord. I'm going to invite the worship team um, to come up right now. and They're going to sing a song about Jesus being at the center of our life. And I'd like to just have a time of prayer and then they will, they will sing. So would you bow your heads in prayer with me? Oh Lord God, Heavenly Father, we just have to take a moment uh, in this time of prayer, to just bring our needs before you. Uh, Lord, you know um, where people are at. You know the struggles, the difficulties, the challenges they're facing. And we just ask, oh Lord, that you would uh, move in their hearts and their lives. Lord, we pray for those who are facing uh, health difficulties, hospitalizations. Lord, would you just be present with them? Would you place your healing hand upon them? And Lord God, we, we, pray, we pray for the situation in Afghanistan. We pray for those who have lost their lives and, and for their families and their loved ones. Lord, that you would just wrap your loving arms around them, that you would be their rock and their refuge, be their strength, that they would look to you for hope. Lord God, we pray for the situation uh, down south with the Hurricane Ida. And we just ask, Lord God, that you would reduce the winds, that you would that you would give people common sense to get out of harm's way and that you would be with those first responders, that you would protect them, that you would help neighbors to love neighbors and especially that you would raise up your church uh, to love in your name and to serve in your name. Oh Lord God, right now we're going to hear a song about Jesus being the center. 
in such a fallen, broken world, he is our only hope. And he desires to be the center of our hearts, our relationships, our homes, our life. So Lord, may this, this song be our prayer as well. And Lord, um, we just pray right now because each and every person in this room, those who are watching online, all of us have scars. We have relational scars, sexual scars, emotional scars. And I pray that each and every person would look to Jesus and his scars from the cross and they would know how much they are loved and know how much Jesus wants to forgive and accept and redeem and make whole and make new. So Jesus, would you be at the center? In your name we pray, amen.